the plaintiffs and the movements. Uh, Your Honor, Don Godwin here, joined by Charmaine Beckton and Todd Shadle on behalf of the defendants. Can Your Honor see, see my presentation? I can. So Your Honor, we're here on a motion to exclude two different experts. The first is Professor Lewin. I know the court's general reaction that it does not uh, favor excluding experts, but I will tell the court in a long time, I've seen a lot of experts. If there's ever gonna be experts excluded, it's this one. First, Professor Lewin, Lewin, who is from UCLA, as a predicate, I will tell the court, he has been excluded at least seven different times over the past few years. Those are just the instances we can find. And as you can see from this panoply of exclusions, he's been excluded from federal courts and state courts with regularity. And I won't go through all those. And I get that just because you've been excluded in other cases doesn't mean you get excluded in this case. But as you'll see from these opinions, as I apply them to what happened here, what you'll notice with Professor Lewin is a real pattern of sloppiness as an expert. Here's the opinions that we asked to be excluded. His first opinion is fairly common sense. You're not, your PowerPoint isn't moving, just so you know. It's still on the front page. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, hang on. Give me one second, Your Honor. Okay. I'll, I'll, uh, the, there's four opinions that he offers. The first is, is that, um, that bonuses are a widespread component of companies' executive compensation. Give us one second. We'll make it work so you can see the actual opinions. Can you see it now, Your Honor? Yes. Okay. And is it in? Uh, all right. All right. Can you see now the, the particular slide? I can. Okay. So here, here's his first opinion. Bonuses are a widespread component of companies' executive compensation policies and practices. That's so generic and so unnecessary of expert testimony that what the plaintiffs or the defendants have now morphed it into is, well, it's not just that, it's that it's a common practice for a part of an executive compensation to be comprised of performance basis, bonuses based on the success of a transaction. Court knows that links here that there was a sale of a, of a significant asset. The defendant Ricky claims that he was entitled to and obtained a hundred million dollar bonus for that. Here's the problem with that opinion, why it should be excluded. First, I don't think that requires expert witness testimony. There's no doubt that this company in the past paid bonuses and paid bonuses in connection with transactions. And it's not really a disputed fact. Of course, the actual issue here is, which is why his testimony isn't relevant is, is that, is that it is whether it's typical to pay a bonus is not the issue, but whether the bonus here he obtained was fair and reasonable. So that's the issue, not in general, do you pay bonuses, do you pay transaction bonuses, but what actually, happened here where that was fair and reasonable. But third, even if you got past all that, there's no basis for his opinion because he doesn't offer data to support his conclusion. And this is why he historically has been excluded in other cases. Here's where he says, and I don't know if the court can see the actual excerpt of the report I took, but you can see from paragraph 17 of the report, he says it's a common practice of a transaction bonus. And he says it's supported with this information he got from Standard & Poor's capital IQ. And he says, look here, 83% of the companies in this field paid bonuses. But if I add in the next sentence of his very report, he contradicts himself and says, although the data I'm using does not break out transaction bonuses from other bonus payments, it's well known companies do this. In other words, I've cited you some data that says people pay bonuses to support my conclusion, they pay transaction bonuses. But I acknowledge the data I'm relying on doesn't actually break out and give me that information, but don't worry, I know it. He then cites their footnote 13. There's I can't see what you're referring to. I'll just so you know, it's all it's still on opinion one. Okay, give us one second, Your Honor. Maybe take a, a 30 second break. Sure. Just 
Yes. Can you see it now, Your Honor? My specific slide. If I had better eyesight, I could. It's really small. Okay. Uh, okay. Second. I guess I can read it. Yeah. Hang on, Your Honor. Let me. Let me. Let me. Let me. Uh... It's it's a little better now. Okay, we're going to bring it up in a, a better mode for you. There so, we go. That's great. All right. all right. So we'll just, well, I need to run it from uh, here. Play from start. All right. Is there any way we can take it out of this? He yeah. sees. All right. Do you see the main slide there, Your Honor? Yes. Okay. And I think I showed you this slide. Did you see this? I did not. Okay. So this is Professor Lewin. He has been excluded at least seven times by federal and state courts. I know generally that's not necessarily a ground to exclude him here, but when you divine why he's been excluded, you notice there is a consistent pattern of sloppiness. And so when you look at his actual report, you'll see that. So his first opinion is that bonuses are a widespread component of companies' executive compensation policies and practices. That's generic. You don't need an expert for that. And so what they've done and what they write in their response is, well, look, it's not just that report. It's that um, they make these bonuses, companies pay these bonuses based upon transactions. You get a bonus for a transaction. And he puts that in their response. But there's reasons why that opinion itself, even if allowed, wouldn't be excluded. First, it doesn't require expert testimony. You don't need someone to come in and say companies typically pay transaction bonuses because we don't dispute that we paid in the past transaction bonuses or that that's a practice out there. So that in itself is not relevant because the issue isn't would we have ever paid a bonus and is it a common practice? It's whether or not he used and breached his fiduciary duty to obtain a $100 million bonus in this particular case. But even if you said, fine, I get that, uh, uh, Tillerson, let's let it in. The problem is, is that there's no basis for it no empirical data. And this is a consistent problem with this professor in other cases. So here's his report. And I know it's maybe hard to read, but he says there's a common practice of transaction bonuses out there. And he cites a source where he says, here's this report. And it says 90% of the companies paid bonuses in this field. The problem is when you add the next sentence, he concedes the data doesn't break down between regular bonuses like annual or yearly bonuses and what he's opining about transaction bonuses. So the very data he relies on to support his opinion doesn't actually give him the data to do so. I then looked at the footnote site he has there and the footnote site contains two sites and I'll bring them up for you. I know they're small. It gives two examples from two newspaper articles of people getting large bonuses. The first one was uh, the CEO from Anadarko the problem there is, is that it wasn't a transaction bonus. It was stock options. He sold the company to Occidental and got cashed out of his stock options, which is not a transaction bonus and not what's that issue here. So it wasn't even what he says it was. And then second, it wasn't customary in practice. In fact, it was quite controversial, which is why it made the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So it doesn't even support his conclusion that this is ordinary. I looked at the second one, uh, which was an article from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, which dealt with the Gillette CEO selling his company to Procter & Gamble. Again, the same issue. He got his compensation from stock options and grants over a four-year period. So not a transaction bonus. These are guys selling their company and yielding essentially cash out of their equity. So again, doesn't support them. And worse, it too was controversial. Everyone was happy that he sold the company, but his compensation was the subject of this article and other criticisms, so not typical or ordinary. And then finally, he cites a third one. He says, well, there's other data around there that shows that in these small companies, CEOs get these transaction bonuses all the time. But I looked at it. He cites a, a, a report that he then gives no data from. And when I put up the next sentence of that very paragraph, it says, although you know, I've said this and I've cited this data. Once again, the data doesn't break it down between transaction bonuses and regular bonuses. So he concedes yet again, the information he's relying on doesn't actually give him the data that he needs right then and there, second time in a row. He then cites one example in his report, uh, a company called Akova. And I looked at that as the entire part of what he cites this company, not a single footnote or citation, nothing across the board, 
no evidence to support it, period. And now you can kind of see why these courts have said, wait a minute, you don't substantiate your sources, you don't have the right data, you draw conclusions from data that doesn't exist. And that's exactly what happened here with respect to that opinion. And therefore, I think that first opinion, which is really not relevant, isn't even supported by data that can be considered. The second opinion involves the issue of a clawback. So we dispute and say that the bonus itself was unfair and it was a breach of fiduciary duty. But to the extent we're bound by it, we claim as part of the agreement that he agreed to a clawback, which means if he left before five years, he'd have to give back a pro rata portion. They want to offer uh, Professor Lewin to say, well, you don't really ever attempt to claw back a bonus. This opinion has got a, several problems. Once again, first, no empirical support for his conclusion. It kind of goes like this. If I was to tell you I've never seen a whale, so they must not exist, is basically his argument. Here's why. In his report, he says, I offer my opinion on a comparative basis, which is to say that I have not previously encountered a situation or example of business owners attempting to rescind a bonus payment made to an executive, or for that matter, an employee. Since he's never seen it, it must not exist or be typical. Now, to be fair, the last sentence of that paragraph is, my experience covers hundreds of companies. So if I was to modify my example, but I've been on a lot of boats, that would not make this any more um, reasonable or admissible. And that's why he starts, you can see some of these other opinions, why he gets excluded, because he really just starts saying ipsy dixit things. I've never seen one, therefore it couldn't be typical or ordinary. But second, and this is rather extraordinary because I've never actually seen this, Your Honor, in 30 years, which is that the opinion they want to offer from Lewin is contradicted directly by their other expert. Let me show you. Here's the opinion by Professor Lewin, which is, he says, clawbacks are not customary or reasonable. They then offer, and this is the defendants, offers another expert as well, Professor Spindler, who we've also moved to exclude, and he says the exact opposite. He talks about typical clawback arrangements and says it's a term of art that is typically used in the industry. And in fact, they're so typical apparently and became more prominent after Enron and the 2008 meltdown and have become so typical and ordinary that he thinks there's best practices about it. So you have Professor Lewin saying these aren't typical or ordinary and their other expert, Professor Spindler saying, uh, actually they're quite typical. Uh, and you see them a lot and have best practices. Now, neither one of these opinions, I think, need to be admitted. But Professor Lewin, who has just simply said, I've never seen one, therefore they can't exist, in and of itself, that has to be excluded. I mean, you've got one guy saying no, while the other guy says yes, in a classic situation. But the difference is, they're both experts offered by um, the defendant in this case. Finally, the opinion is irrelevant. Here's an excerpt of an email, Your Honor, which is kind of the crux of the whole argument. It's from the defendant, Mr. Renicki. He's asking the company lawyer to draft a quick letter agreement with the Thompsons to pay a $100 million bonus, but they want to claw back over five years on a pro rata basis. Our contention is you wrongly procured this bonus, but if you did get it and it wasn't wrongful, it was on a clawback. And therefore, when you departed our company for whatever reasons prior to that five, year, five years, it's pro rata. And the issue is, did he agree to that? Did the parties agree to that or did they not? The issue is not whether this is typical, whether this is ordinary, whether this has anything to do whatsoever uh, with standard <laughs> practice, because it is a contractual battle. I'll tell you that Professor Lewin kind of focuses on this equitable clawback issue, which is, he says, you know, I've never really seen a clawback except when there's been fraud, like with Bernie Madoff or someone else. And that's not really the legal issue we're talking about. We're talking about contract formation. And that's why courts have consistently said that Professor Lewin should be excluded because he uses the wrong legal standard. Now, by the way, we asked Professor Lewin in his deposition, well, what if the parties agree to it? You know, how does that affect your opinion? His answer at page 78 was, I don't know what I would opine. So on the key legal issue, which is did the parties agree to a clawback, Professor Lewin concedes he has no relevant opinion to offer on this. The opinion number three is really the crux of a significant issue, which is they want to use Professor Lewin to kind of get into the fact that the $100 million bonus is reasonable. It's a reasonable amount. Now, because 
uh, Mr. Renicki, the defendant, was a fiduciary, we believe the burden is going to shift to him to prove it's reasonable. Uh, and this is a critical issue. We think any opinion related to this needs to be um, excluded. A couple of reasons. First, not in the report. It's just dead clear it's not in his report. Nowhere in there. And here's his deposition testimony, an excerpt of it. And it's one of many where he was asked over and over again, are you opining that Mr. Renicki got was a customer in reasonable amount? He said, I don't cite or quote an amount. That would be correct. Mr. Patton, who took his deposition, followed up and said, I want to make sure that you're not opining in any way uh, a opinion that somehow the transaction bonus awarded was reasonable. And he said that would be correct. I could cite you 10 other instances in his deposition where he said that. But later on in his deposition, he sort of came back and tried to, in effect, rescind that opinion and offer some kind of opinion that what was going on here was reasonable. So I'll just tell the court, I want it in black and white, that this expert, Lewin, cannot offer an opinion that the amount of the bonus, this $100 million, was reasonable. And here's why, Your Honor. It's their burden. They don't have an expert to offer that the amount paid was reasonable. We did retain an expert who did market research to do it. And it's important to us that that be the, um, the position of the parties at trial because that's what they chose to do. I don't think they could find someone to say this amount was reasonable and they shouldn't be able to allow to sort of crawl their way into it through late oral reports. I will also point out to the court that his basis, if any, for saying the amount was reasonable uh, um, is based purely on speculation. And he concedes, concedes in his deposition that he didn't employ the standard methodology an expert would employ to determine if a bonus is reasonable. Here's his testimony. He concedes there at page 132 of his deposition that there is a methodology for determining whether or not a bonus payment is reasonable. And of course there is. There's experts and companies out there that do this kind of work to help companies figure out what's a reasonable amount to pay people. We hired such a person as our expert. One of the issues in the case is, is that Mr. Renicki, the defendant who is the CEO, did not hire anyone to help my three clients determine if the $100 million he was basically demanding on from them after the transaction closed was reasonable. Their expert who concedes there is this methodology was asked, did you perform that methodology? He says, clear as day at page 132, line 17, he did not. So no methodology for him. You can now see why courts have excluded him in other cases, that he doesn't follow methods. He doesn't have methodology or analysis. Finally, I just want the court to note that what his opinion actually is, is entirely circular. He says bonuses are customary and reasonable, and the company agreed to pay the bonus. Ergo, it must be a reasonable bonus. Now, I know you think I'm embellishing what he said, but here's the actual quote. Quote, I'd say that the owners approved the payment of the $100 million transaction bonus. I think they engaged in a customary and reasonable practice. Ergo, the payment is reasonable in plain English. That's the basis. That, of course, is the classic Ipsy Dixit that he was excluded for in Washington, D.C., where you say, well, they paid it, therefore it must be reasonable. Think if that opinion was allowed, that would justify almost any bonus of almost any amount. Those are the three opinions that are the core of what he plans on offering. As the court can see, there's significant empirical problem issues, there's significant legal impediments, and there's also relevancy issues. A fourth opinion, which he put into his uh, rebuttal report is, is that he then tries to rebut our expert who provided a market-based opinion the amount was reasonable. And by market-based, we mean, Your Honor, they go in and they compare people. This is what the, the, the best percent made in your class with your kind of company with this kind of deal uh, and is going to opine that the $100 million bonus um, obtained by Mr. Rodnicki was so far outside the norm of, of reasonable uh, on it. And, and it's important to us because they've not tried to contradict that, that testimony regarding that not be allowed in at the last minute. Now, he tries to claim that our guy didn't really look at facts or circumstances necessary, but I do want the court to know that he never looked at or used methodology to figure out what was the right or appropriate bonus in this case. And his effort to try and interject this issue that somehow because the company approved the bonus, therefore it must be reasonable, must be excluded. 
So that's Professor Lewin, and I will tell you, Your Honor. Well, look, in- we, we don't really have time to handle all of this unless, because we have, this was only scheduled for 30 minutes. So uh, let's let's just deal with Lewin today, and we'll deal with Spindler tomorrow. Yes, Your Honor. All right, response on Lewin? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you for the opportunity. Judge, I know from having defended, and you have seen many motions to exclude brought before you. And one of the first things that you hear out of the movement's mouth, out of the counsel's his argument, is, well, in all of my years, I've never seen one that needs to be excluded more. This is the one. This is the absolute perfect example of somebody that should be excluded <coughs> because their, their opinions are irrelevant. They're not going to be helpful to a jury. They're not going to give you any information, the jury any information, with which to help them make a decision. Judge, well-settled law, as you know, dictates that the preferred method for challenging an expert is not exclusion, but rather a vigorous cross-examination. If you're up to the plaintiff here, they would just submit you a judgment and say, none of these, he, neither of his experts should be allowed to testify, and, is, and, and the defendant is not credible, so here's a judgment. Now, you got to take us at face value. Judge, a rigorous cross-examination is what I find I found so many times with the court saying, we're going to allow these people to come in here. I'm going to listen to what they're going to present. I'm going to decide then if what they're offering is relevant, and will that be helpful to a jury? And if it is, it'll be admitted. If not, I will exclude it. But I don't think we ought to put and in, and in, in put cuffs on me coming out of the gate, Your Honor, and not be able to come in here and defend this lawsuit, which will be one of the largest cases tried in years in Dallas County and State District Court. We're talking about $100 million. We're not talking about a few thousand dollars or somebody fixing a car or or some personal injury damages, all of which are important. We're talking about a major deal here. I'm entitled to have my case heard and my client have his opportunity to a fair trial considering all experts. Your Honor, Mr. Tillotson argues that, well, because this particular expert, Mr. Lewin, Professor Lewin, has been excluded in a few cases, he should be excluded here. He's arguing that. Well, we know from the Jimmy John's case that is cited, Your Honor, that it is inappropriate to claim that exclusion in other cases mandates exclusion here. That court in the Jimmy John's case continued upon review and stated that the other cases that were cited had nothing to do with the facts in this particular case, and they don't hear, Your Honor. So there, it's a it's a smokescreen, and that is, well, because he was excluded once, twice, maybe even seven times, maybe out of the hundreds of times that he has been an expert, we want you to be able to exclude him here. Judge, I suggest to you that it, that is just that is just terribly wrong. To be relevant, Judge, under Rule 702 and 401, an expert's proposed testimony must be sufficiently tied to the facts of the case so that it will aid the jury in resolving a factual dispute. That's what Professor Lewin can aid this jury with. The expert opinion testimony is appropriate, Your Honor, when the factual issue is one that the trier of fact would not ordinarily be able to understand without technical or specialized assistance. They're alleging my client breached a fiduciary duty. The burden therefore falls on him to show that what he did was fair, that it was just, that it benefited the company, if you will. Contrary to plaintiff's contentions, Professor Lewin's opinions explain customary, reasonable practices for executive compensation, the roles and authority within companies, for owners and board members, Your Honor, as well as the dynamics at issue and the bonus transaction, issues that are not within the average juror's common knowledge, as we all on this all on this screen know. Your Honor, Professor Lewin's opinions are reliable. They're based on his review of the depositions of key witnesses in this case, reports from Brian Cumberland, one of their proposed experts, pleadings, and other key documents in this case. He relied on his own own experience, but also on customary and generally accepted principles, Your Honor, which are standards presented by numerous books, 
articles and others efforts listed with its report. As the court know, it's not for the court to decide if what the if that the experts' conclusions are correct, but whether the analysis the expert used to reach those conclusions is reliable and therefore admissible. We know that, Your Honor. That's axiomatic. And therefore, I suggest to you, you've got to hear the testimony. We also know, Your Honor, that one of the easiest ways that I've experienced in over 40 years of doing what I do in trying cases in courts around the country is as when there's an exclusion of an expert, you're almost given a free pass. In most appellate courts, when they see that an expert, one or two or more was excluded, they're going to they're gonna start looking behind and pull the curtain back. They're going to peel the onion back. And I suggest to you that it makes more sense. It's, it's more judicious and, and judicial efficiency and economy to try this case. Let my experts testify, Your Honor. Let my man have a fair shot coming out of the gate to defeat this claim, which he believes is not, is not, does not have merit. Let us give a, have, have an opportunity to do that rather than go through it, exclude an expert, Professor Lewin, and or, and or Professor Spindler from the University of Texas. He's wanting to exclude both of them. Uh, let us have an opportunity to have the case tried. Don't exclude any of them, Your Honor, of my, of my, of my experts. Don't exclude either one of them. Let's go and then try the case and then see what a, what a jury verdict does. If, if the verdict turns out favorable to me, we'll know what happened. If it turns out adverse to me and the experts have not been excluded, I'm going to have, have a harder, more difficult hill to climb in that court of appeals. If the trial court here, Your Honor, and all of your wisdom, and I respect you, Judge, I respect your decisions. I'm not here to second guess you. But I will say that if you exclude Professor Lewin, it would be subject to, to review, and I believe that would, perfect, it would provide a, a, a way of possibly reversing the case on appeal. No guarantee, but we know the books are, are replete, the cases are replete with instances where experts have been reversed, where they've been excluded and cases been reversed. Courts say that, speakers say that in the CLE seminars, appellate judges say it, excluding experts is dangerous ground. Judge, with regard to the three opinions that my client opined, opined on, there were four of them. The fourth one, as Mr. Tillotson says, was my client, uh, number four, he was explaining why their proposed expert, Brian Cumberland's method is flawed. He didn't address that. But with regard to the three opinions, I'll briefly address them and be very brief because I know we're coming to the end of the time. Judge, the, he, he opined and said, the payment of a transaction bonus to executive and non-executive employees is a common practice and is customary and usual portion of executive compensation. That's what Professor Lewin said. He go, goes on, Your Honor, Professor Lewin's opinion is that it is a common practice for a part of executive compensation to be comprised of performance bonuses based on the success of a transaction, which this transaction went from, it was going to be a $600 million sale of some significant oil properties in West Texas out near in the Odessa area, Judge. A tremendous sale through my client's efforts and that of Frank Peterman, who also was involved in receiving a $100 million bonus along with Linda Gordon, now deceased, uh, and, and, and Christy Thompson, they also, they both of them received $100 million bonuses that were categorized and classified as bonuses. They all did it, Your Honor, and they took the sale from 600 million through these Herculean efforts to a billion and $50 million. They took it from 600 million to a billion 50 million. Your Honor, Professor Lewin also explains the role of owners and their authority within the privately held company to make decisions about executive compensation. There, Judge, there's a very different notion than a simplified version of Professor Lewin's opinion that plaintiffs advance in an effort to render it admissible that, quote, many companies pay their employees executive, especially executive bonuses. Judge, the fact that executive executives receive transaction bonuses 
as opposed to compensation generated from another source is central to understanding the factors at issue in this litigation, including the reasonableness of the bonus and whether Rednicki acted properly with regard to the bonus. We believe that Professor Lewin can aid the jury in finding a decision to that question. Rudnicki, Your Honor, I respectfully suggest and say to you, must be allowed the process by to present the process by which he, backed by an expert in, incompens- in ex- executive compensation, believes that this is an appropriate business transaction. He opined on that in opinion number one, Your Honor. Opinion number two out of the three that Mr. Tillotson discussed. He says it is not customary and reasonable to attempt to claw back a bonus. He opined on that. Judge Professor Lewin is not saying that having a clawback agreement is prohibited. Let me reinforce that. He is not saying that having a clawback agreement is prohibited as plaintiffs suggest, but that based on his experience and his review of literature on executive compensation, the act of recouping a previously paid transaction bonus is not customary or reasonable in relation to a transaction bonus as it may be with a signing bonus. We have something entirely different here, something entirely different. This is not a signing bonus. This is a transaction bonus where a, where a man, my client, was significant and, and, and critical in taking the sales price from 600 million to billion 50 million. Judge, with regard to the last point I'll make on its own opinion number two, is Professor Lewin explains not only that he has seen clawbacks for paid transaction bonuses in practice, but that such clawbacks are unheard of in the literature of executive compensation of transaction bonuses. He says that. And he can be examined about that on cross-examination. As they say, a vigorous cross-examination is much preferred to exclusion. The last opinion that Mr. Tillotson spoke of, Your Honor, that my client did, did proffer, is that, quote, the $100 million bonus was reasonable because paying bonuses is customary and reasonable, and parties have freedom of contract. Your Honor, the plaintiffs here make an enormous leap that reasonable would just mean paid in in an effort to oversimplify Professor Lewin's opinion in this case. Rather, Judge, rather, Professor Lewin's opinion is that the practice of paying transaction bonuses to executives is customary and reasonable, and that here, given that all the owners were at the table and approved of the $100 million bonus, For the four of them, Frank Peterman, Linda Gordon, Christy Thompson, and Paul Renicki, they were all at the table when the decision was made, evaluating the success of the Red Bull transaction, which was the highest price ever been paid for this type of property in the state of Texas. The transaction, excuse me, Your Honor, uh, evaluating the success of the transaction The payment, Your Honor, of the bonus was consistent with industry standards and and Thompson Petroleum Corporation organizational governance policy. They had been doing this before, as Mr. Tillotson said. It's just that the number was greater here because the success of the transaction was so much greater, was so much greater. Plaintiffs also assert, Your Honor, that Professor Lewin has not offered an opinion as to the reasonableness of uh, Rudnicki's bonus amount. When analyzing, Your Honor, the Red Bull bonus was reasonable. Professor Lewin does not, and I emphasize, does not use market-based analysis, but rather a study of the facts in the case, including the approval of the owners. All three of them approved it, two of whom got $100 million bonuses at the same time. And the ultimate value creation for the company that are key in determining what is reasonable in the context of this transaction. Professor Lewin should be cross-examined about that. Your Honor, those are, are, my, um, are my responses to Mr. Tillotson's 
arguments on the three opinions. He really didn't say much about opinion four other than my client argued through his expert, Professor Lewin, that Brian Cumberland's method was flawed in what he had to say. Your Honor, I urge you, I urge you to deny the motion to strike Professor Lewin as an expert and allow the man to, to come in to the courtroom and, and provide his testimony. You can rule upon it as we go. And, let, and then assuming that the testimony, and I believe it will be, be found to be relevant and reliable and credible and helpful to the jury. Let's see what the jury does with it. Let's don't wonder about it once he's excluded in the unfortunate event that were to occur and then later wonder. All right, we, we, we got to move, move forward. Uh, Mr. Thank you, Judge. Uh, I guess, I mean, I do, I think this, Mr. Godwin does raise a good point on, you know, you've kind of <laughs> shown that there's a lot of possibly analytical gaps here or, or analytical issues with this. Why don't you want to just handle this through cross-examination? I would love to, but that always interjects the issue of jury confusion, that they're confused about what it is they're looking for, the standard, so that they, they begin to think the issue is whether or not it's typical parties would do this rather than they actually agreed to it. So that, that's the problem um, with this is always say, well, I'll just get it in, you'll cross him. But the confusion issue for the jury, and there are different legal standards here for the actual bonus that he obtained, the $100 million. There, the question is, did he wrongfully obtain that? And is that amount reasonable? Not, do people typically pay bonuses? Did the company agree to this? Those are not the issues. And so I don't want the jury to be confused because that's significant. For the clawback arrangement, it's classic contract formation. Did we agree to it? Did he agree to it? Confusing them with saying, well, people typically don't do that. Uh, and that's not ordinary. Wouldn't be evidence you would necessarily allow anyway in a, in a, in a contract case, because no one here is, is saying, I may or may not agree to it, but it's not typical. Therefore, I guess I didn't agree to it. No one's offering that as a factual defense. So I'm mostly confer concerned about confusion of the jury. And then finally, this third point, which is huge to us, is they don't have someone who went and did the work to say the $100 million isn't reasonable or is reasonable. And as a result, they should not be allowed to sort of ad hoc their way into this by whatever things that he can come up with. That's a huge point to us because it's important that I be able to stand up and say, no evidence from them, no expert, no recognized methodology at all presented to them about that $100 million amount. And, I, and, and for them to kind of muck it up and have me just say, well, remember in cross-examination, he did all this and that is unfair to me. Um, the, the argument that, that Mr. Godwin is making to you was, has essentially been done away with by the Texas Supreme Court, as your honor knows, and made you the gatekeeper. You don't just let it all in and see if the jury can sort it out because yeah, there is this. I would prefer that I actually, but <laughs> I, I listen, I, but, I, but, you know, we spent but, the first so part let, of our let, career. Let, under let, me just, let me just say this because we're way, way, way behind is uh, I am going to strike the opinion on clawbacks. I do think that, that, that that's inappropriate uh, on the other two opinions. I want to kind of hear what, what the, the issue is with Spindler. Uh, and so we'll finish those tomorrow uh, but I am striking the opinion on clawbacks, but uh, Thank holding you, off until tomorrow on the rest. All right, guys, uh, I will see you tomorrow at nine o'clock. And, uh, and if Mr. Tillotson, it would be very helpful to know what's going on with this probate and what, and whether or not maybe even having one of the probate attorneys to sign on just to say, Hey, look, this is what we need to have done at this point. I haven't seen this a lot in cases like this, where we have a, probate issue. I see it a lot in personal injury cases. So I'm just not sure. Has there been a writ of Surrey Fosha's filed or anything like that filed in this case? Or is that even appropriate right now or suggestion of death? Yeah, I don't think it's appropriate. We can't really do anything until we get the the independent, the, the personal representative appointed. So we haven't filed anything yet. We've alerted Mr. Godwin about this issue and we've, we've, we've briefly discussed it. We're hopeful to get it resolved so we can keep our case moving in our trial date, but I'll, I'll have the best available information tomorrow for your honor. Judge, I'd like, to, I'd like to clarify one point that is on the clawback. You're going to allow us to try the case and, 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 and the witnesses talk about the clawback, are you not? 
I am striking his opinions about clawbacks. His opinion only. The, obviously, the parties are going to be able to talk about the clawback and the yeah, fact. Just okay. his opinion on clawbacks. I'm sure. I understand, Judge. Thank you. All right, guys. I'm way behind. See you guys tomorrow. Okay. What time tomorrow, Your Honor? I, I forgot. Uh, Nine o'clock. Nine. Thank you, Your Honor. There, Thank we you. have a lot of stuff set tomorrow morning. We're just, we have trial okay. settings for next week. We have trial settings for this week. We have your trial settings. We have a bunch of stuff set right at nine. And we're just, so you, you might want to bring some stuff to work on because we're going to have to, I don't know how long it's going to take, but we're going to get, everything okay. is just in flux right now. So we're just trying to do the best we can. Yeah, you are. No problem. Thank you very much. Until yeah. tomorrow. Bye-bye. Before I go to the McMillan case, do you guys have an agreement on the Clark versus Renfro case for a trial setting? We yeah. don't have an agreement. We have conferred regarding it. Um, and we had uh, proposed an ASO that we just hadn't gotten a signature on for a November trial date. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, if you oppose that date, Mr. Renwick. No, I, I certainly don't. I, I have no idea why we're taking up the court's time on this. And the only thing I'll say about it is I sure did enjoy that argument by two fine lawyers before. So. <laughs> Glad two of the best there. lawyers in Dallas, I think, between the yeah. two of them. Yeah, two. We'll, we'll sign whatever agreement is sent over, and, and we apologize for taking up the court's time. Well, we, we need to, right now, we need to pick a trial date. Everything else okay. can, uh, can So we over. had sent over an ASO to uh, defense counsel proposing November 14th, 2022. So um, if that's still available with the court. and It would be November 15th because we do trials on Tuesday. Okay. That's yeah. Is that I'm okay not with you, Mr. Runwick? Yeah, that, that's fine with me, Judge. Rhonda, uh, we're going to go ahead and set this trial, which is DC 213008 on November 15th. And we will submit an ASO to you once we get all the signatures on that. Thank you. You guys have a great day, okay? You too, Thank Judge. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. McMillan versus Navarrete. Are both sides here on that? Good morning, Your Honor. Chase Garrett for Defendant Earth Motor Cars, LLC. Anyone here for the other side? I do not see Mr. Shelton. I've not seen him log in this morning. How about Mr. Garrett? Uh, no, uh, Mr. Garrett? He's the other defense attorney. Yeah, I'm. That's me. So I'm. I'm here for defendant Earth Motor Cars. Brad Westmoreland uh, was for another defendant, but that defendant has settled out. We filed a response, right? He did. Why don't you call Mr. Shelton and find out what's going on? It kind of surprises me that he would uh, not be here. You know. Sure. I can do that. Okay. Why don't you check on that, and I'll go to the next hearing for now. Okay. Uh, so, um, Mer Merched versus Farmers, Texas County Mutual Insurance Company. Are both sides here on that? Yes, Your Honor. Mark Tarabi on behalf of the movement. Uh, you're, you're muted. Good morning. Sorry. Yeah, uh, Sam Amaji on behalf of Plaintiff. All right. Do you want a record for this? Um, I don't think we need one, Your Honor. Okay. What do we have left at this point? Your Honor, uh, we received um, supplemental responses um, on Friday from um, Mr. Merchhead. And I will boil this down and, and take as little time as, as possible because I know you're busy. We have, um, I, I believe there's there's still a couple of outstanding issues. First okay. of all, it's um, the response to request for production number three. Um, in specifics, Your Honor, we've asked for them to sign the IRS form, you know, authorization form for us to obtain tax returns for the last five years. I will submit to the court, I, I would think three years would be sufficient um, rather than five to the extent that they've objected that it's unduly burdensome. But the issue, Your Honor, is, I mean, they've objected saying it's its irrelevant and um, you know subject to privacy concerns, et cetera. Those are not valid objections. Um, the reality is this is a 
case involving a theft claim filed by Mr. Merched to Farmers Insurance. The responses and objections we initially received obviously were detailed in the order, but you know, to the extent that they've cured, I mean, well, so it's a theft claim. So he's not even making a claim for lost wages, but you want his right. income tax re returns. Yes, Your Honor. And I'll explain the reason for that, Your Honor, because in, in the course of investigating the claim, not only um, does plaintiff um, respond now, even with his supplemental responses, that he doesn't have documents responsive to virtually every request we've made um, after a diligent search. The reality is that, you know, he had submitted the claim initially to farmers saying that he had purchased this this vehicle that was allegedly stolen from a dealer. Um, and it turns out, Your Honor, that, that the dealer, the dealership is actually a company that's owned by the plaintiff. Um, so the IRS would be very relevant, highly relevant to this, because obviously we just completed a deposition. We have not yet received a transcript of the deposition of Mr. Merched. But um, to say that the responses that we've received with respect to the relationship that he has to this company, et cetera, are, are, are vague is, is a gross understatement. We really have no information um, relating to what relationship he has with this company, um, what his role is. I mean, he just said, basically, I'm an officer. That's about as much as I could get out of him during the deposition. The other question, Your Honor. Well, that I think so, so, so explain this. So he uh, owned a vehicle. And you believe that the vehicle, he bought the vehicle from a dealership that he has some type of relationship to? Yeah, I mean, I, I've left out an important fact in this, um, in this case, and that is that he also, we have uncovered evidence that he had a, a Hummer that fits the exact description of the one that he claims that he bought from this dealer that he owns, um, that he had had one in his driveway for a number of years that apparently never moved, um, uh, for which he also claims to have no records, no information, no VIN number, nothing. So that, that has nothing to do with his tax returns, though. No, no, no. But the but the idea that he says that he bought a new Hummer that matches the exact description of the Hummer that was in his driveway from a dealership that he owns. We're in I, I, okay, I, 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 I've heard it up. I'm going to sustain the objection on that. Thank what you. else do you have? And then on interrogatories um, five and six, Your Honor, I believe the only um, that's the only response that he still objects to in number six. He objected to the question on interrogatory number six: produce a copy of all communication, correspondence, email, text messages, and recordings between you and alternative motor cars, um, et cetera. It, he's objected to that as a, a duplicative of request number five directly above it. And request number five directly above it is alternative automotive, which is a DBA, I believed. But you know, regardless, alternative automotive and alternative motor cars, you know, he's objecting to this saying it's duplicative. Clearly it's not, but also um, in response to the prior question that, you know, again, it's an after diligent search plaintiff has no documents responsive to this request. It seems unlikely. I mean, but if that's going to be his response to number, that, that there's no documents, no text communications, nothing, um, no emails, that's fine. But, you know, again, the objection doesn't clear that issue up. Response. Your Honor, we, we clearly stated uh, that there is no, uh, uh, our objection was it's the same entity. So whatever he requested in five, it's the same what we requested in six. So, but uh, would that... it, 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 I'm going to overrule that objection. You just, if it's the same, then you just say produced for five and six. And so what we said is we don't have anything at this point. So we, so we, we responded and we said we don't have anything at this point, Your Honor. Objection is that objection is overruled. Is that it, Mr. Trabi? The only one left, Your Honor, is interrogatory number 13. Um, in that interrogatory, we've asked um, what to, for him to describe. Um, and I apologize, I'm on the wrong document. That's... It, identify your relationship with Muhammad and Al-Sharif. And the answer we received was he is an employee of Alternative Motor Cars, comma, Inc. That may be true. However, there's no relationship to the question that we asked was identify your relationship to this individual. Um, 
I don't know. Hey, Mr. From, Osma, I, I agree. You need to go into a little more detail because you'd have to describe what your relationship is to that company. And so describe the relationship between the two uh, co-workers or boss or whatever. Yeah, that's what, what, what we stated is um, he is this this individual is an employee. Uh, we have an employee employer relationship. So he's an is that stated in the response? Yes, Your Honor. And he it's, we said he's an employee of Alternative Motor Cars, Inc., to which we are an officer of this company. Your Honor, just briefly, he, it doesn't include anything about being an officer. And again, it sheds no light on what the relationship is between these two individuals. We, we can revise that, Your Honor. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Just get me an order on that, Mr. Trabi. Uh, when you prepare the order, please state that it's uh, this was heard on January 31st, 2022. Make sure you share it, Mr. Almazri. Uh, make sure that you uh, email Rhonda, my corp coordinator, a copy of the order after you shared it, shared it with Mr. Almazri, and also uh, make sure you e-file it as well. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you. Thank you, you guys. Can... You, have, you yeah. have a good day. You too. You too. Sorry for the delay. Thank you. Mr. Shelton, everything okay? We, You're muted now. Yes, Your Honor. My, my apologies. I'm prepping for a trial tomorrow and it just i didn't see the calendar reminder so my apologies that's all right i figured so you followed the response and you've always done a good job in the past so we wanted to make sure you just yeah that this kind of stuff happens with covid and remote and all that stuff yeah so. i appreciate it thank you and thank you all chase right. for giving me a call and yeah, no big deal I, I reviewed everything i have i can make a decision pretty quickly but if you also want to make an argument you can yeah i'll, I'll be very very brief your honor um this is uh, sort of the continuation of an earlier summary judgment hearing that we had in, in June, and the court did continue it to allow the parties to conduct discovery. After conducting discovery, the case didn't get better. In fact, it got worse for the plaintiff. Um, this is an accident that took place at about 1030 at night on a Sunday. Uh, the only connection between that accident and my client is that my client owned the vehicle. There's been a case uh, that came out in the Fort Worth Court of Appeals in October of 2021. We cited it in our reply brief. That case holds that uh, whether the vehicle was owned by the uh, by an employer is not probative evidence that the employee was in course and scope. We have uncontroverted evidence that says that this was Sunday night. This was not within course and scope. This was a borrowed vehicle. Uh, the case that we did cite in our Reply brief is an enterprise rental car case. This is an employee that paid $200 a month to, to use a personal vehicle. That case held that ownership of the vehicle is not probative evidence. It does not prove course and scope. You have to go into some analysis to see what about that particular trip um, made it within course and scope. The business was closed. He does not run errands on behalf of the business. Um, that evidence is uncontroverted. I took um, the plaintiff's deposition. I specifically asked him, do you know whether he was acting within course and scope of his employment the night of the accident? Plaintiff says, I don't know. We served interrogatories on the plaintiff. Uh, if you contend that the defendant, Eric, or that the defendant, Ivan Navarrete, was acting within the course and scope of his employment with Earth or is performing a task to further Earth's business, state the legal and factual basis of that contention. And the response that we received was plaintiff has not completed discovery this is premature. This case is set for trial next month. This is a case that cannot continue as a matter of law. This was not within course and scope. Uh, because it's not within course and scope, that's like the domino effect. All the other causes of action sort of fail behind it. They have pled a negligent entrustment claim, Your Honor. Uh, at the time that the car was lent to Mr. Navarrete, I think it's also worth noting that Mr. Navarrete's insurance has settled uh, and the plaintiff's been paid six figures. Um, but Mr. Navarrete, at the time he borrowed the vehicle from my client, he gave them a valid driver's license. We've cited cases in our motion, Your Honor, it's the budget rental car case and other cases that specifically say, upon receiving a valid driver's license, a vehicle owner has no further duty to investigate the competency of the driver. So imagine you get off a plane, you go stand in line at the rental car company, you hand them a driver's license, that's it. That's the end of the inquiry that the rental car company is not obligated uh, to then perform an analysis on your past driving history. Um, 
and they've introduced no summary judgment evidence that says that my client should have known he was a reckless driver other than they attach a copy of his criminal history report and they want the court to draw the conclusion that because Mr. Navarrete had prior convictions for drug use and drug um, distribution, those sorts of things, that that made him a bad driver, or that my client should have known that he was a bad driver. So uh, frankly, my, my client can't understand why they're in a lawsuit uh, for loaning an employee a car over the weekend. Um, they have a borrowed vehicle agreement. They got a copy of his driver's license. They got a copy of his insurance. And um, this lawsuit had been on file for almost two years before my client was added on the eve of limitations. So this is not a claim that should go any further. This, this cannot go to trial next, next month or ever. It would be a waste of, of, you know, jury members' time because this is a directed verdict case. There's no liability as a matter of law. Dalton? Yes, Your Honor, I'll address them in reverse order. We'll start with the negligent entrustment uh, claim. This is not a car rental company. I understand there's a line of uh, jurisprudence about car rentals. This is not a car rental company. This is a car seller that uh, had allowed their employee who has multiple DWIs, who's currently on about to be on trial for this DWI because he was drunk when he hit my client and fled the scene in the Earth Motor Cars car. Uh, let's talk about inferences that can be drawn from peculiarities about this borrowed car agreement. Uh, when, and we pointed it out in our response, when we took the definition of uh, Mr. Cortese, the owner of Earth Motor Cars, uh, he talked about how dozens upon dozens upon dozens of employees of Earth Motor Cars had filled out similar uh, agreements uh, and he didn't require them to put a credit card number down. You remember that there was no credit card number down. And out of those dozens and dozens and dozens, every one had been destroyed except this one. This is the only one that's been kept, which leads to an inference that this could have been after the fact. We could have, ah, I let you take the car, you got in a wreck. Well, let's, let's put this together after the fact. That's an inference that could be drawn. But even more, Mr. Cortese <clears throat> admitted that Mr. Navarrete did drive Earth Motor Cars cars for business purposes. He drove cars to car shows, exotic cars to car shows. He actually filled out a demonstrator agreement, which says you're allowed to be in the car and drive the car with prospective clients. And even though he was a finance uh, manager, he said that would certainly be within the course and scope of his job. So they had a duty to look into his background. They should have known he has multiple DUIs. Uh, as for the course and scope, it's the same thing. An inference can be drawn that the Earth Motor Cars badged vehicle, Audi, that was out in uptown Dallas, uh, the purpose of that was to display that vehicle, to be out where things were happening. Uh, that is in the course and scope of the business. There's at least a scintilla of evidence uh, to support that. So I, I know the court's read all the filings. I won't take any more time. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and grant summary judgment on the issue of respondeat superior and deny it on negligent entrustment. Okay, guys, just go and give me an order on that. Mr. Shelton, go ahead and prepare the order. Well, you're getting ready for trial. Why don't you uh, let Mr. I, Garrett prepare? I, I, I can get you an order, it's okay. All right, just give me an order. Make sure that it says that I, this was heard on a, uh, January 31st, 2022. At the beginning, make sure you email Rhonda, copy of the order and e-file and make sure you share it with Mr. Garrett before you submit it to the court. Yes, Your Honor. Good right. luck with your trial. Where are you, are you trying to case here in Dallas? Uh, Tarrant County, okay. County Court three. All right, thank, thank you so you. much. Your Honor. Okay, I don't know what you guys are here for. I don't have any other cases set. Oh, are you here for the Ray Austin Holdings case? I thought this hearing was canceled. Your Honor, good morning. Steve Tittle for Defendant Stone Coat of North Dallas, LLC. Your Honor, we had two 91A set for this morning. The, oh. the third party defendant non-suited about a week and a half ago. And then the other respondent is plaintiff. They non-suited about 45 minutes ago. Normally, I'd be very happy. And as the court, you know, it is a matter of law upon the filing of the notice that it is effective. But there is a different provision in regard to 91A that provides that the court shall not consider a non-suit filed within three days of the hearing on the 91A. But specifically, there's a deadline for the respondent. No, I'm to aware get the of that. It's I mean, 91 point. Let, let me just say this. There's two ways we can handle this, Mr. Tittle. I can either uh, 
accept the non-suit. You can drop your claim for attorney's fees. We can go on our way, or I can grant the motion. Uh, and then I'm not going to award attorney's fees. What do you prefer? Your Honor, that's very clear. Um, the, the reason we persisted in this is this is our second defendant that we have represented, and we've had the same situation. The first time we had to file an MSJ, which the court uh, generously gave the other side an opportunity to continue. Then we came back in right before we had the MSJ. They non-suited. Then they sued another one of our clients, likewise, who has no involvement in this case. That's why and we had the opportunity to file a 91A in this case. And we, we did support our motion with a cost and necessity affidavit for attorney's fees for roughly $13,666. Uh, it's, it's because it is the second time we've had to represent uh, another defendant who has no involvement. And there were statements on the record at the time that plaintiffs said, well, we would be glad to dismiss you know, some of these defendants, as soon as we find out what they did or didn't know, we just don't know. We just sued them. And we, we, we did not move for sanctions. Instead, we sought the attorney's fees for the 91A. I, I understand the court's option. So, okay. So you kind of went around on that. So do you want me to grant it and then not, and then I'm not going to award attorney's fees or do you want to just make, do the non-suit? Your Honor, I understand the court's position. I appreciate it. We, we would ask the court to grant the 91A. Response? Mr. Lips, is Mr. Lipscomb on the other side? No, he is not, Judge. Your Honor. He is, he is a party, but he is not a uh, plaintiff's okay. counsel. Yeah. Plaintiff's counsel has not filed a response or appeared. Okay, go ahead and just give me an order on that, Mr. Tittle, and uh, we'll take it from there. And make sure you give me what I said before, just make sure it says... This was heard at the beginning on January 31st, 2022. Email my court coordinator and e-file it as well. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you for your time. One thing that I would alert the court, today is the deadline to have the order signed based on the 45-day rule. Oh, okay. So go ahead and uh, e-file, uh, shoot. So I need to sign it today where it's denied exactly. by operational law. Okay. Um, Rhonda, make sure you email that immediately to Rhonda. Rhonda, this is, is urgent. I need to get that as quickly as possible. So e if I were you, Mr. Tittle, go ahead and email it to Rhonda. Call Rhonda. Tell her that I've told you it's urgent. Uh, and she's just responded said she heard that. Uh, and then you go ahead and, uh, and then Rhonda, go ahead and email it to me. I'll sign it and scan it and send it back. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. All Thanks, right. Sir. And Tony, Rhonda, the, well, that was the last hearing. So uh, our next one is at 1.30.